important that we uh, understand and we come to understand and share the, the love and the peace of God uh, with one another. And so uh, as we uh, continue in this uh, teaching series today about the goodness and the, and the love of Jesus, we're, we, we're going through a 13-month a uh, study into the life of Jesus. And so uh, I, I, if you follow me on social media, uh, you already got a, a, a tease with this. If you don't follow me on social media, um, would you please? I, that would just make my heart happy. So, uh, but um, um, last week, uh, we missed two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, Pastor Wilder and I, along with um, three other very brave men, uh, two of whom came to pick us up. They wouldn't even let us drive because they, they know they came and picked. We were able to do something live online for you. And then last week, uh, I filmed something from my home, and I hope you've watched online. Uh, uh, but I learned something last week filming that uh, at home. I learned what uh, most of you must feel like after sitting through one of my teachings um, uh, because uh, I, I was on, in the floor of my house in front of our fireplace and I was there for about 75 minutes. The teaching didn't go that long, but I'd, I'd film something and I'm like, no, that doesn't work. And so we're doing And then I'd set this thing up so it was really awkward. And about uh, 30 minutes in, I'm like, I'm in trouble because I couldn't feel my legs. And so... Um, uh, at the end, something happened, and <laughs> thankfully the people that edited it didn't put it on there for your enjoyment, but I thought, you know, just like I said, I learned what it must feel like to sit through uh, one of my sermons. So for your viewing enjoyment this morning, uh, here you go. Welcome. Be like, can we have more church weeks where we don't have church? Are there going to be funny videos of Pastor, <laughs> Pastor Tim up there? Um, but um, I was trying to get up, and if you notice the the bookshelves um, just to my left, I have glass doors on them, and the only thing I'm thinking as I'm falling is, dear Lord, please. <laughs> Not the glass, not the glass, not the glass. And he was gracious enough. And, and so maybe this is your first time around Miami Valley. And uh, I, I shared with a couple of pastor friends of mine that I was going to do this, sent them the video. And, and they're like, why in the world would you do that? You don't come off very well in that clip. And I'm like, well, my people know that I don't come off very well most of the time in my life. And so, uh, but, but the reality of it is this. Around here at Miami Valley Church, uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously, but we take Jesus very seriously. And, and we're going to be a group of people who uh, stumble, who fall, and who uh, figure out how to help one another back up. And so uh, I was just mindful that this is what we need to do, especially when we talk about Jesus. Because when we dig in and we get into the life of Jesus and we come to discover just how gracious he is, the scriptures say in John chapter one, uh, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as if the only begotten son of God, full of grace and truth. And we start to understand what it looks like to, to, to know Jesus' grace, as we start to understand what it looks like to speak truth and love. I mean, I think just things start to change. And, and it's not just uh, because of uh, we want you to have information. We want you to know Jesus so that it can transform your life and transform uh, the way you live. And so we've been digging into the word and, and we, we looked at Jesus from before the womb and we're gonna look to Jesus till after the tomb. And I don't know, is the teaching outline next? I didn't use this first one. Is that the slide that's next? Yeah, uh, Pastor Wildridge and I have, uh, here's what's gonna happen between now and uh, the Sunday before um, Mother's Day, uh, you can just see what we're going to do, and we've got these planned out, and we're just going to take a look at kind of the chronological uh, life of Jesus as he, as he goes through, and by the way, there's something special happening on March 6th we don't want to tell you about, but you're going to figure it out, and so uh, we're just going to set, that's a Wednesday night, something special as we think about Jesus, and so uh, this is just where we're going, but, it, but it's not just so that you can have information. Our, our world is looking if we're going to get intentional about uh, reaching people for Jesus, reaching people who are far away from Christ, if we're going to get intentional, especially the younger generations, one of the things we're starting to understand about the, about the millennial generation is they say, we, we don't trust anybody. The only organization uh, that millennials trust at this point are, is the United States military. Everything else, they come in. And the one thing that they want more than anything else is authenticity and transparency. And so I don't have a problem saying, hey, I fall down, and it's, we're not going to edit everything out. It's just how we're going to be. But the generation that comes after the 
the millennials, Generation Z, Gen Z, or whatever else you call it, uh, somewhere around, depending on how you measure, born after 1996, some say 98, some say 2000, the, the generation that comes after that, uh, what they're looking for more than anything else, what they want more than anything else is just data. They just want information. Just tell us the information and let us decide. And, and so uh, this became a reality in my life as uh, I try hard not to go to certain stores with my wife. I, I don't know if I, if I can get an amen from any of the other men, and maybe you don't want to do thank you very much. Um, there's one honest man in the room. And so, uh, but now that we're empty nesters, there are just certain times where she likes me to go with her, and so I do. And so uh, after Christmas, before New Year, uh, I went to uh, this store with my wife, and when I get bored, the first thing I do is I head toward the checkout stands, and I look at the magazines. I just want to know what's on the cover of magazines, and I went, and it captivated my attention because I started seeing things I hadn't seen in magazine racks for a long time. Here's uh, the first picture that I saw. Uh, Life magazine, Jesus, who, who do you say that I am? Wow, right there in the Target checkout line, but that wasn't it. Uh, here's next a couple pictures of color. Uh, Mysteries of the Bible, uncovering its origin, its characters, and its miracles. Uh, then the birth of Jesus, right there in the, in the checkout line because people are longing for information. Watch the information. And then w- one more, uh, Jesus and the origins of Christianity. And there are lots of people trying to chime in on, on who Jesus is and who Jesus was. In fact, uh, just this week, one of our daughters, who, again, were empty nesters, lives away from home, I got a package in the mail from her, opened it up, and, and there was a card in it that said, hey, Dad, I, I saw this in the checkout line of my favorite store, Target. And, and haven't read it, don't know anything about it, but thought it might be something you'd like. And she knows very well because it's just out there and people want information. So we're trying to give you information about Jesus, but it's not just about Jesus because here's what we need you to understand. That Jesus from before the womb to after the tomb goes like this. He is the eternal word. And he got the first word. And he became the living word so that we might have the spoken word. So that he might provide for us the written word to remind us that he gets the last word. Maybe another way to say it this morning is we want to spend 13 months digging into the life of Jesus and understanding it because, my friends, until Jesus is enough, nothing else will be in your life. Whatever it is you're looking for, whatever hole it is you're looking to fill, until Jesus is enough, nothing else will be. Jesus is the answer to everything you're looking for. And the question for today, for us who are following him, is do we know his word well enough so that we can trust him? And so we're going to jump into the story today. If you brought a Bible, I hope you did, or your mobile device, uh, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Uh, Just remember, we've seen Jesus as the eternal word, that he existed before the womb, that he spoke into creation all that exists. We saw that he became uh, the lamb from Bethlehem, that he was born of a virgin. We're going to see that he lived a life of perfection. We we saw next that that he was taken Uh, to the temple when he was 40 days old so that a guy named Simeon and a lady named Anna could prophesy over him. And and then last week, if you watched the teaching before I fell down, uh, we took a look at Jesus uh, at age one or two when the wise men finally showed up uh, at the house where the the child was. And they went to uh, Herod and they said, where's the one that's born king of the Jews? And they sent him on to Bethlehem. And they came and they bowed down and they worshiped the child. But Herod had lied to them. Remember, Herod lied to them and said, hey, come back and tell me where he is so I can go worship him too. But that's not what Herod wanted to do. So God, through an angel, spoke to the wise men and they departed back for their country by another way and didn't stop by from Herod. And then we saw last week that when Jesus was about two years old, a Mary and Joseph take Jesus and they flee into Egypt because Herod, the government, had issued a decree to kill all the babies. And so, my friends, I just want to say to you this morning, You should not be surprised when on your news, on the nightly news, you see the government has issued a decree that it's okay to kill babies. It is nothing new. It is the same old lie. It is the same old demon. New government, same demon. So do not be shocked. Do not be surprised when the government acts that way. And so we have to understand how are we going to respond then as Christians. And so if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, we now move forward, verse 41. Now all of a sudden, 10, 11 years have passed from the last time we saw Jesus uh, in in a house, one-year-old, two-year-old, the wise men come to bow down to him. Now he's age 12. 10 years gone by. 
and he's age 12. And we're gonna get into this passage of scripture. By the way, just very quickly, those of you that are parents, uh, how many of you can tell me if I were to ask, and some of you maybe even have video or a cute story, how many of you, by show of hands, can tell me the first words your child ever spoke? Yeah, some, some of you. And all of us dads were hoping for dada, right? And it usually ended up mama. And, and, but, you, but you know the first words. This passage of scripture are the first recorded words of Jesus. We know that he spoke things before then, but at age 12, this is the Bible's account. These are the first words of Jesus, and I think the Bible writers are intentional about giving us these words in this context. Luke chapter two, verse 41 says this, every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Every year, Jesus' parents, as faithful, law-abiding uh, Jewish people, uh, fully participating in, in their observances, would go to Jerusalem uh, three, four times a year. But every year, for sure, at Passover, where they come to worship, where they come to offer sacrifice, where they come to find the forgiveness that God has to offer. Uh, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. And, and this should grab your attention, because up to this point, um, children come, children don't come, but every child, male or female, is required to come at age 13. Because at age 13, according to Jewish law, uh, the young man or the young woman is no longer a child. They are considered an adult. And as an adult, they become a fully functioning member of the religious community. In fact, uh, they have a phrase for this, uh, bar mitzvah, right? And, And it means son of the commandment. And at 13, Jesus, because it would be the way his parents had raised him, would become a fully functioning bar mitzvah, a son of the commandment. Uh, for a female, it's bat mitzvah. It's the daughter of the commandment. And, and, but, but it happens at 13. This is a year early. And, and you should be surprised, and you should sit up and take note. Uh-oh, he's not supposed to be there age 12. That's supposed to be next year. And some amazing things start to happen. Uh, by the way, uh, we find out that it takes place in the temple uh, for, the, for Luke, who writes the Gospel of Luke, the temple is so critical. In fact, we're only uh, almost through chapter two, and Luke has already introduced the temple to you three times. He introduces you first to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who's a priest working in the temple, and, and he doesn't trust God, and he can't speak. Then, then we see it, day 40, Jesus is taken to the temple where Simeon and Anna uh, hold him and prophesy over him. And now at at age 12, he's in the temple. Keep reading the gospel of Luke and get all the way to the end of chapter 24. And the gospel of Luke ends this way. Jesus has ascended into heaven. And the last verse of the Bible, last two verses say, and the people went back to Jerusalem and they went to the temple where they continually worshiped God. The temple is important. Later this summer, I'm gonna do a teaching as Jesus as the temple uh, on why we need to understand Luke's gospel of the temple. So it takes place in the temple. You need to understand the context. You need to understand that, it's, that, it, that he's only 12. And, and now all of a sudden, it says this, verse 43. And after those days were over, as they were returning to their hometown, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. They lost him. One job, take care of God's son, and they lost him. Now, now understand that the caravan of the day, it, it's not safe to travel by yourself. It's not tra- safe for parents to travel. If you have young children, teenagers, they're not gonna travel alone because of everything that can happen on the roads. And so they're gonna take this about 60 mile journey. And so they're gonna travel with relatives, they're gonna travel with friends, and scholars are gonna say that this caravan, this traveling party that they're in, ranges anywhere from a half a mile long to a mile and a half long. And the idea was, I'm with friends, I'm with family, and uh, who knows, uh, maybe Jesus is hanging out with uh, Mary's mom and dad, grandpa and grandma. They're not concerned, they're not worried. But after a day and they haven't seen Jesus for a little while, like every parent with a 12-year-old, a precocious 12-year-old little boy, like, I bet he's getting on somebody's nerves. We better figure out where he's at. And so they start to look for him and they can't find him and they went a day's journey after a day. So they return, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. So if it's a day's journey there and a day's journey back, it's two days that they haven't seen Jesus. But that's not enough. Uh, Verse... uh, they went a day's journey, then they were looking for him with, among all of his friends. When they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. Verse 46, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. After how many days? Three. Play along. One more time. After how many days? Three. Luke wants you to know this is a third day story. Anybody else remember anything that happened in Jesus' life on the third day? He, he, he conquered the grave. 
But not only this, here's a mom and a dad who've lost Jesus, and three days later they find him. That's how Luke's gospel begins. You know how Luke's gospel ends? It ends with the resurrection. But on resurrection morning, people show up at the tomb and they can't find Jesus after three days. And there are two, I think it's a couple. Uh, we know the guy's name is Cleopas, and I think it's Cleopas and his wife, and they're walking from Jerusalem to their hometown. And they're sad, and they're downcast, and Jesus shows up and starts walking with them, and they don't recognize that it's Jesus. And Jesus says, why are you so sad and downcast? And uh, Cleopas looks at him and says, are you the only one in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what happened? That the guy that we were counting on to be the Messiah, to be the Redeemer, to be the Rescuer, we thought it was going to be him, but our woman showed up at the tomb, and it, he wasn't there. And what's more, this is the third day. Because the third day is the day you give up hope unless Jesus is around. But the gospel begins and the gospel ends with a, with a husband and a wife wanting to know where Jesus was because they couldn't find him. Has that ever been indicative of your spiritual life? You've been walking for a while, walking through something for a season, walking through something for a cycle, and don't feel like Jesus is anywhere around and you wonder where is he at? You feel like you've lost him. You feel like you've lost hope. You feel like you've lost a uh, direction. You feel like you've lost enthusiasm. Has it ever happened in your life? Evidently not. It's only happened in my life. And so uh, here, here's what I've learned. Whenever I'm walking and, and stuff starts to get heavy and stuff starts to get moving, I wonder where Jesus is. You know what I've come to discover is what Mary and Joseph discovered. It wasn't Jesus that moved. It was them. Jesus was right where he was supposed to be. Right where he was supposed to be. And he shows up. And they show up. My friend, if you're here today and you're struggling and you're wondering, hey, where's Jesus? I, I feel like I've lost hope. Would you, would you hang in there? There's a third day story coming your way. When you don't think life can get any better, when you think everything's gone and we think the, the last door's been shut, don't forget, on the third day, he showed up. He showed up. So they returned to Jerusalem after three days. They found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Verse 47, and all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. There's 12. 13-year-olds, yeah, they, they, yeah we, we get that. They'd have this discussion. But here's this 12-year-old, and he's amazing them. And they're astounded by his answers, and they're astounded by his questions. And can you picture the scene? They're looking for him, looking for him, looking for him. Three days, they come to the temple. There he is. And they see all the teachers, and they see him sitting in the middle of the circle, and they see Jesus talking and asking questions. Whew. But not everybody's real happy about it, namely his mama. His mama is not pleased. Verse 48 and when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother asked him, now, here's what I need you to do before I read this. I need you to think about that time in your life when you received the worst verbal scolding you ever received from your mother. Can you hear her voice? Can you hear her tone? She is not happy with you. She is not pleased with you. And it goes something like this. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. She wants him to know, I'm not happy with you. I'm not pleased with what you've done. You, you, it's three days. How in the world could you do this to us? How could you put us in these kind of, this kind of emotional situation? And now, verse 49, all of a sudden, we get the first recorded words of Jesus. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be about my father's business? Why were you looking for me? You knew right where I would be. Didn't you know? Now, I need you to see some. This is a third day story, but something amazing happens here. And, and it's one of the main questions of the day. One of the main questions of the day. Would, would you grab hold of this? Age 12. Don't miss this, parents. One of your most important tasks. Don't miss this. At age 12, Jesus was fully human. Yes, he was fully God, but he was fully human. And he didn't just come to things with an immediate understanding. His parents taught him how to understand the word of God. His parents taught him how to understand who he was. His parents nurtured him on his spiritual journey. Do you understand what he understands at age 12? He understands and has settled once and for all his identity, his value, and his worth is found only in the fact that he is the son of God. His identity and his worth is established, his value and his, his well-being comes only in the fact that I am God's child. And so my question for you today is this, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a child of God? And if, be careful how you answer, because if your answer is yes, you should no longer be struggling with your identity, your value, and your worth. Because it should be found, if you know you're a child of God, 
That's where, at age 12, and our desire as parents is to help our children understand it. But I watch so many at 32, 42, 52, 62, still wrestling with this foundational question of where does my value and worth come from? And from the life of Jesus who lived on planet Earth by faith, he settled his identity once and for all. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're a child of God? And if you do, are you living for an audience of one and finding that your value and your worth comes only in that relationship? John, as he writes the gospel, talks about Jesus, uh, the eternal word becoming the living word and full of grace and truth, said when he came to planet earth, his own didn't receive him. Look what verse 12 says, but to all who did receive him, he gave the right to be children of God. Don't pass over the phrase. Children of God, to those who believe on his name, God loved, God gave, we believe, we receive, and now we're a child of God, and our value is not based on anything we can do, it's based on only what Jesus did. John says it this way in 1 John 3, 1, see what great love the Father has given us so that we should be called God's children, and we are. Do you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you're a child of God. This is an amazing thing to understand, and it's the first thing. I want you to have three words on your mind. I want you to have the word message, I want you to have the word mission, and I want you to have the word vision. I'm gonna talk to you about message, I'm gonna talk to you about vision. Pastor Wildridge is gonna come up and talk to you about vision. But this is the message of Christianity that never changes. I'm not gonna have time to go through all of your, all of your teaching outline, but just jump down on your teaching outline. Uh, it says, our message, it says 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20. Do you see this? It says, For God was in Christ, uh, restoring the world to himself, no longer counting men's sins against them, but blotting them out. This is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. We are caught Christ's ambassadors. Uh, uh, God is using us to speak to you. We beg you as though Christ himself were pleading with you. Receive the love he offers you so that you can be reconciled to God. Do not miss out on the fact that God loves you and he wants you to be his child. Tim, how do I become his child? Scripture says this, God demonstrated his love for you in this, that while you were still a sinner, Christ Jesus died for you. Scripture said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you're now his child. And that should settle our sense of value and worth, and we need to learn to live there. Our message never changes. Maybe I could put it this way. Our message is this. There is no mess too messy for Jesus' grace. There's no mess in your life that's too messy for Jesus' grace. No jail time, no addiction, no divorce, no pain, no hurt, no abuse, no affliction, no affair. There is no mess too messy for the grace of Jesus. And that is our message. And until Jesus returns, that will never go away. And that was the message of Jesus, full of grace and full of truth. This is a third day story, and the first question is uh, about the message, and the message never changes. The second is about the mission. It's an interesting phrase that Jesus used. said, didn't, why, why are you looking for me? Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? Some of you are leading, reading from different translations. It doesn't say father's business. Some of your translations say, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Uh, but that's not how the Greek reads. The Bible, you just becoming familiar with the Bible, the Old Testament written mainly in Hebrew, the New Testament written mainly in Greek. Um, uh, here's my translation. I took my Greek New Testament out, and here's how I would translate um, Luke 2, 49. And Jesus said to them, why is it that you are, you are seeking me? Did you not know that in the things that are my father's, it behooves me to be? It, it doesn't say business. It doesn't say house. It's, it's just... The, it just leaves it empty. It leaves us for us. So literally, it's in the things of my Father, it behooves me to be. My second question for you today, very simply, is this. What behooves you? Because here's what I know. What behooves you moves you. And some of you are behooved by athletics. And that moves you and you orient your life all around it. And some of you are behooved by automobiles and some of you are behooved uh, uh, by fixer-upper stuff and some of you are behooved by all the other kinds of things. And I just tell you right now, whatever it is that behooves you, moves you. And Jesus said, why why are you looking for me? You ought to know what it was that behooved me. Some of your translations say it is necessary. Uh, I had to be about. It's just this sense, my friend. What is it that, that behooves you? And I hope that it's the message of Jesus Christ. You, you want to know what it ought to be that behooves you? 
Five times in the Gospels recorded for you on your teaching outline. You can go and look look them up. Uh, Here they are on the screen, kind of hard to see. But five times Jesus says this. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so often the American church has misinterpreted that verse. We've taken that verse and we said, our cross is just that thing that's our burden to bear. No, no, no. The cross is one thing and one thing only. It's an implement of death. The Christian life is all about this, learning how to die. Learning how to die to yourself. The Christian life is not about self-improvement. The Christian life is about self-denial. The Christian life isn't about how can I make my life better. The Christian life is how does God want to work in me so that if my life never gets any better, I can be faithful. This is our mission. It behooves me to be about my father's business. Here's what I came, I've come to understand in my own life. When I make it my business to be about his business, I don't have time to be all up in your business. And so many of us but most of our time wanting to be up and all, all up in somebody else's business. And sometimes in the, in the life, and Pastor Ward is going to talk to you about this, sometimes we, we can't live a life, Jesus' life together alone, but sometimes uh, what behooves me is oh, I'm better than them because and I got the solution for them. My friend, if I make it my business to be about his business, I don't have time to be up and all up in your business. Unless God calls me and you to share that journey together, then we can have that conversation. What is it that behooves you, my friend? Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And for as long as we have breath, the message of Miami Valley Church will never change. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through him. And the mission of Jesus Christ will never change for, for Miami Valley Church. And our mission, very simply, you'll see it on your teaching outline, our mission, very simply, is to reach people far from God so that they know Jesus, so that they go for Jesus, and so that they grow to be more like Jesus. And I hope that you didn't miss one of the most powerful moments in this service today when a 14 year old young lady prayed and she said God whether it's we're at school or work wherever we go this week help us to grow to be more like you that mission never changes but then this fascinating thing happened Jesus has this conversation with his mother it's the first recorded words because it's about his message, it's about his mission. But I need you to look a couple of verses later because now we understand what vision is. Message and mission never change, but vision changes by season. Look what happens in Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Then Jesus went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. Twelve-year-old Jesus, amazing teachers, amazing rabbis, holding his own, in fact, teaching the leaders of the church something. Mama shows up and says, why are you treating us like this? And Jesus said, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And you'd expect that Jesus had just talked to her and she'd just, okay, just stay here in Jerusalem, just do whatever. You know what Mama Mary said to Jesus? I don't care. Get your 12-year-old behind in the caravan. We're going back to Nazareth. And he did. Look, it's what, not what I said, it's what the scripture says. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And for the next 18 years, from age 12 to age 30, we know nothing else about Jesus' life. But this was a season. It wasn't his season to be in the temple preaching. It wasn't his season to be doing miracles. It wasn't his season. This was a season in his life that was going to change. He'd have a season to do miracles. He'd have a season to heal people. He'd have a season to feed 5,000. He'd have a season to teach. He'd have a season to go to the cross. He'd have all kinds of Passovers, but not this season. This season was simply a season for him to be obedient to his mom and dad, to understand the first commandment with a promise, honor your father and mother, and you will have a long life. And Jesus lived out his season in faithful obedience. And my question to you, this is right now, my friend. When it comes to vision, seasons change. What are you supposed to be doing in this season? Some of you have been camping out in a season. And you know the great things about seasons? They have beginnings and they have ends. And some of you have been living in a season that God ended a long time ago. And it's time for a new season. And it comes down to whatever season you're in, whatever it is God calls you to do, it comes with a call to obedience. Message never changes. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. Mission never changes. Reach people far from me so that they can know, go, and grow for Jesus. Vision, it changes by season. Would you welcome Pastor Ward to the stage as he comes to talk to us about the vision of Miami Valley Church.
Good to be in the house of the Lord today, amen? amen. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be looking at Joshua. Go ahead and turn there, Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, in this season of life, God has been walking me through the book of Joshua. We're going to start here in 1.1. 1, 1. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of God, God spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Get going. Cross the Jordan River, you and all the people. Cross to the country I'm giving to the people of Israel. I'm giving you every square inch of the land you set your foot on, just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon east to the great river, the Euphrates River, all the Hittite country, and then west of the great sea, it's all yours. All your life, no one will be able to hold out against you. In the same way I was with Moses, I will be with you. I won't give up on you. I won't leave you. Strength, courage. You are going to lead this people to inherit the land that I promised to give their ancestors. Give it everything you have, heart and soul. Make sure you carry out the revelation that Moses commanded you. Every bit of it. Don't get off track. Either left or right, so to make sure you get where you're going. And don't for a minute let this book of the Revelation be out of mind. Ponder and meditate on it day and night, making sure you practice everything written in it. Then you'll get where you're going. Then you'll succeed. Haven't I commanded you? Strength, courage. Don't be timid. Don't get discouraged. God, your God, is with you every step you take. And it's just a reminder that that God is right here with us. I want to give you the context of, of the story here. This is God's people, the same people that were led out of Egypt, right? They were uh, enslaved in Egypt. And God told Moses that, Moses, you are going to lead my people out of this slavery. And so Moses delivers them from Egypt. And here they are, they've been wandering through the wilderness. And now they're at this place, right? It tells us here that Moses, the one who led them out, is dead. But God is telling them that there's somewhere else that they need to go, that, that this place that they're at right now is not the final resting place for them, that they are to go to the, the promised land that he has told them about. And so just some truths in here that, that stuck out to me was when he says, wherever you set foot, you will be on the land that I have given you. He has already prepared it in advance. He says, no one will be able to stand against you for as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will never fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He is with us. I want you to see the comparison here uh, in Exodus 14 when he's talking to Moses right before they, they go through the Red Sea, right after they are delivered from, from Egypt and Here's Pharaoh who's chasing after them with the Egyptian army. And they're standing at this point right before the Red Sea and they're stuck, right? Because before them is this, this barrier that's, that's, you can't get through it. But watch what God says here in Exodus 14, the comparison. As God says to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Speak to the Israelites, order them to get moving. Hold your staff high and stretch out your hand over the sea. Split the sea. The Israelites will walk through the sea on dry ground. And it's just a comparison. Here they are again. Here they are in front of this barrier, the, the Jordan River now. No one's chasing them at this point, right? The Egyptians are not chasing them. But here they are, there's something in front of them. And at this point, I, I wonder just how easy it would have been for them to get comfortable in this place, for them to set up camp, for them to... to to own this place and just say, you know what, we're good here. There's nothing chasing us. There's, this is a place where we can rest. But that's not what God is calling them to. I want you to look at the response in Joshua 3.11. It says, look at what's before you. The Ark of the Covenant, the chest of the covenant. Think about it. The master of the entire earth is crossing the Jordan as you watch. Now take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from each tribe. 
When the soles of the feet of the priests carrying the chest of God, master of all the earth, touch the Jordan's water, the flow will be stopped. The water coming from upstream will pile up in a heap. Verse 14, and that's what happened. The people left their tents to cross the Jordan, led by the priests carrying the chest of the covenant. When the priests got to the Jordan and their feet touched the water at the edge, the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest. See, this is important. Don't miss this. It tells us that at this time, it would have been the harvest season, which for us would have been an early spring, so uh, roughly March, April time frame. And what this means is, is this river that's before them, this barrier that's before them, that's standing in front of them, that's blocking their path to the promised land. This, this river would have been overflowing at this point. That it wouldn't have been low where you could just step across stones to get through it. No, it's at its highest place. That it's actually filled to the brim. And so it just reminds us that, that God is so powerful that even when the river or the barrier or whatever it is is at its highest, he can get you through it. But it says the flow of the water stopped. It piled up in a heap a long way off at Adam, which is near Zarethan. The river went dry all the way to the Arab Sea, and the people crossed, facing Jericho. Verse 17, and there they stood. The priests carrying the chest of the covenant stood firmly planted on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground. Finally, the whole nation was across the Jordan, and not one foot was wet. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. These people had to act in faith, though. I wonder how easy it would have been to just stay there, to, to get comfortable. See, I believe that, that we retreat in times like these. Our, our human nature is to, to fall back, right? Because of the fear, the uncertainty of what's before us. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. And I believe that that's what was happening here, and that's why God had to continue to speak to these people Strength, courage, strength and courage. In fact, one time he says, haven't I commanded you? Strength and courage, because our natural instinct is to get comfortable, to, to fear. But God was calling these people to a new level. The place where they were at wasn't going to be their ultimate landing place. He was calling them to a new level. I believe that God is calling Miami Valley Church to a new level. In fact, as God has been walking me through this passage, I've continued to hear that phrase come up, new level, new level, new level. And I didn't know exactly what it meant. I didn't, I didn't grasp what God was trying to teach me in that time. But then the first teaching of 2019, Dr. Cox used that phrase. Will you watch this with me? just want you to do this. Um, what do you need to remember? What do you need to do when that thing's hanging over your head, when, when you're in a hurry and God's not? Uh, by the way, you, you probably know some people in your life that don't struggle with this. Uh, they walk very closely and intimately with Jesus, and whatever's going on in their life, they're like, man, no problem. God's got this. I'm going to be good. And, and, and if you're like me, what you want to do is like, you don't want to trust them, right? <laughs> you're weird. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you get through this? Uh, I don't trust you. But what if? What if they remembered something we've forgotten? What if they're so focused in on something that, that we don't see anymore? Uh, what if they've, they've developed this, this whole new, new level it's available to you and me when it comes to trusting God. Uh, what do I need to remember? Uh, what? I love how God just confirms his word over and over again. At that point, I hadn't talked to Dr. Cox prior to that about what I had been hearing God speak, and so I, I reached out to him following this teaching. And I said, what? Well, you said something in your teaching roughly a few minutes into the teaching. I said, you said a phrase, new level. I said, was that, was that in your actual teaching or was it something that God spoke to you in that moment? And I just, I love how God confirms that when he speaks. 
And so I wonder, in this story, how easy it would have been for these people. I mean, think about it. They're, there's no one chasing them anymore. They're at a place where they can be comfortable. Their leader, the one who led them out of Egypt, is dead. How easy would it have been to say, let's just set up camp here. Let's do life here. Let's just hunker in here. But I love their response. It said the people left their tents and they crossed the river. But what does this mean? Why am I telling you this? What does this mean for Miami Valley Church? Strength and courage. Courage being the willingness to take action. The willingness to take action. See, I believe with all my heart, and Dr. Cox does as well, that every person in this room or whoever is watching online, we believe that every person has a specific gift and a distinct calling on their life. The question is, to follow that up, is how are you using that to be obedient to God? See, maybe it was something that God spoke to you years ago. Maybe it was something that God spoke to you months ago, or maybe it could have been last night you heard God speak to you something specific on your heart. Don't let this opportunity get away. The time is now, church. I believe that God is wanting to take us to that new level. I believe we are at that point as a body of believers where we have seen the miraculous. We have crossed the Red Sea, so to speak, in faith. We have released from slavery And here we are, and God is wanting to take us to that new level. I love their response in Joshua 1.16. It said, they answered Joshua and said, we will do whatever you command us, and we will go wherever you send us. This should be our response every time. Whatever you command us, and wherever you send us, whatever, whenever. What does this mean? It means we are going to have to truly seek the Lord. It means we're going to have to truly seek the Lord, whether that's personally or whether it's in our family, leading our family to seek the Lord. Maybe it's in a group. If you're not in a group, don't let this slip by. I believe that that is where growth takes place. That's where where community happens. And the more that we get invested in each other and into the lives of, of those who possibly don't know, because a group is not necessarily just a group of of believers, right? It's inviting people who don't know Jesus, people that might never step foot in a church, who would be more comfortable in a home setting, seeing that people are real, seeing that people struggle with addictions or or whatever it may be, right? They go through life and, and we're not all perfect. We fall down. And when they see that walls come down, and they're receptive of Jesus, don't let that opportunity slip by. It means we're going to have to act in faith. It means we're going to have to act in faith. See, I believe that God is putting something on every single person's heart in this room. I believe that God is speaking to you. Are you listening to him? Would you put that on your response card today so we can begin praying with you? We want to encourage you. See, I don't know what God is putting on your heart. I pray for you, but I don't know what God is putting on your heart, what he wants to do through you. Would you let us know that so we can pray with you and for you? Church, it means we have to believe in the unbelievable. We have been, we have been freed. We have been, we have seen the miraculous. Pastor, I wasn't there, but I believe that that group of people who were meeting in Bower too, they had to take a step of faith. I wasn't there, but I believe that they had to take a step of faith when the down payment needed to be made. I'm pretty sure that we didn't have that money in the bank account at that time. <laughs> we have seen the miraculous the way that God has worked through this church. But I believe he is wanting to take us to that next level. 
I wonder how many miracles have been unseen because of the undersupply of courage that it takes. God tells us here strength and courage, the willingness to take action. The question is, are we going to follow him? The message never changes. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. The mission will never go away until Jesus returns the second time as King of kings and Lord of lords. We will do whatever it takes to reach people far from God so that they can know Jesus. Jesus said on one occasion, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. But people can go for Jesus. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you so that you could go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. The scriptures say that the mission is that we go for, that we go for Jesus and that we grow to be more like Jesus. If again, nothing else stuck in your mind, this I hope the prayer of that 14-year-old young lady sticks in your head. If I'm at school, if I'm at work, help me be more like Jesus this week. What season are you in right now? And what God, what's God calling you to do? The season changing for Jesus at age 12 to age 30, the season was to live in obedience to his parents and relative anonymity. Not doing miracles, not healing, not feeding, just learning obedience. What season are you in? Some of you need to move out of the season. That season's ended, and you, you need to move into the season that God's... What step of obedience is God calling you to take? As, as Pastor Rolder talked about vision, he was talking about uh, the Red Sea in front of them and, and, and the army pressing down on them. My friend, here's your choice. Whatever the vision is going to be, whatever the thing God's called for you to do, your choice is to live either in the faith zone or in the safe zone. And this season from Miami Valley Church, it's time that we start living in the faith zone again. So here's the choice. You can choose to live by sight and end up in the land of problem. Or you can choose to live by faith and end up in the land of promise. Watch your choice today. Watch your choice today. Father God, thank you that you are speaking and that you want to continue to speak. Father, for each one that's listened, we've heard a message that never will ever change, that Jesus came so that we could have life. God, for the one who's never trusted in him, for the one who does not know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are a child of God, God, I pray that you give them boldness and courage to pray a prayer like this. God, I do not understand it all. But today, once and for all, I want it settled that I am a child of God. Father, Jesus, I believe that you lived a life of perfection, died a death on a cross, and rose from the dead on the third day. God, I need a third day story. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. Father, some of us have prayed a prayer like that, and life has just continued to happen, and we're tired, and we're worn out, and... um, We can't feel our spiritual legs underneath us, and it just seems like one fall after another. And God, today you want us to take, as hard as it is, a step of faith. It says, God, whatever, whenever, I choose to live by faith. God, as we seek you, we pray that you'd make it abundantly clear for how Miami Valley is to move forward. God, it's a new season. It's a new day of faith. And we will say simply today, whatever, whenever, because you're going to give us land we haven't seen yet. And we choose to operate not by sight, but by faith. God, we love you. And thank you for the things you've done in our lives this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Pastor Walter Jass, on the back of your card, if you've made a decision, you want to let us know where God's at work in your life and how, you could, how we could move forward with you, would you, would you just let us know on the back of your card? 
um, and, and just let us know that. Hey, Don, I'm going to go to some of those slides we had at the end just real quick. Uh, j- just so you know, lots of things going on in the life of the church today. If you have a decision, uh, we'll be down there at the front. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to pray with you. Just a few things to call to your attention. Men, uh, Pastor Roar said, we, we need to be people of prayer. And so uh, the last Tuesday night of every month, it happens every week, but we're joining with two other churches in town, just the men, uh, to begin to pray. And we're hosting uh, the prayer meeting this Thursday. Uh, uh, this Tuesday, I'm sorry, this Tuesday at 6.30, just half an hour. Guys, it's time we show up and we start to pray. It's time, men, it's time we start to pray. 6.30 to 7.30, we'll be joining uh, with, the, the, with the men from Miamisburg Christian Church and the men from the Greenhouse, and we're just praying for God to do something in our city that only he can do. Uh, men, just come and pray Tuesday night at 6.30. Uh, next, uh, I think uh, uh, starting Sunday, February the 10th, starting Sunday, February the 10th, uh, we're offering two classes. If, if you want to, if you want to get to know God better, not only do you need to pray, you need to understand His Word. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a kind of a through the Bible class at 6:30 on Sunday night, 6:30 to about eight. Uh, Pat Peterson and I are going to be leading this. We're just going to kind of open up the Scriptures and say, what's the timeline? What's the story? Uh, what are some of the key doctrines that we need to understand if you really want to get to know the Bible better? Uh, here in the facility, it's called the Way of Life class. Also, Sunday, February 10th, next slide, please, a Financial Peace University starts. If you need to, to get your finances under control so that you can uh, go for Jesus when he says go, this is the time for you. Again, Sunday night, February 10th, uh, 6.30. Pastor Kevin, nine weeks. Is that right? Financial Peace will be but nine weeks long. Lots of other things going on in the life of the church. You can find us on social media. And if I fall down again this week, I'll post that too so you can enjoy that. Would you stand with me for a word of blessing and benediction as we leave uh, this place today? Father, we love you, and we thank you for your love for us. And so, God, I pray that wherever we find ourselves on the spiritual journey, that, God, today we take that next step of faith, that faith to say yes to Jesus, that faith to say uh, yes to being faithful stewards with the, with the mission and the message you've given us, and, God, yes to whatever, whenever, whatever, whenever. Father, may we come to know Jesus and the life that he comes. God, may Jesus be enough. May Jesus be enough. In his name we pray. Amen. Should Jesus not come back before next week, we look forward to seeing you here. God bless you. We'll see you next week.